Thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. And it's always going to be a tough act to follow a man who has his own robot. But um, <laughs> hopefully uh, this will be a good go. So um, yes, the, the title of my talk today is Changing Behaviour by Design. And what I'm going to talk to you about is how insights and methods from behavioural science uh, applied to design projects is the only way or one of the best ways we're going to tackle big societal issues from obesity to climate change in the next 100 years, let alone the next 600. So back in the 1980s, uh, a well-known cognitive psychologist called Don Norman wrote a book called The Psychology of Everyday Things. And he was talking about how the very simple objects in our lives can both drive us mad, but they can also really excite us and, and make us happy. And his pet peeve was those push doors with the pull handles. So when the book launched, it came to really, really good acclaim and his academic peers loved it. But the problem was that, well, uh, people realised that really what he was talking about was the design of these objects, their, their touch, their feel, their texture, uh, their usability, and how actually these products shape people's behaviours and actions. So roughly 10 years later, he, he changed the name of the book to The Design of Everyday Things. And what this beautifully illustrates, very similar to kind of Henrik's point around convergence, is, is how uh, together these two disciplines can come together much more powerfully. And that was the inspiration behind um, the Behavioural Design Lab, a partnership between Warwick Business School, the Behavioural Science Group there, and the Design Council. So Warwick has the, the leading centre for behavioural science in Europe. We have a whole selection of experimental psychologists, economists, social psychologists, working on everything from using Google to predict the stock market through to human and, and primate behaviour in Uganda. So a huge range. The Design Council is an enterprising charity. Uh, they're there to champion the use of better design, design used strategically to improve everyday life for people. And together, we brought these two worlds together to try and tackle these, these big issues. So why? why? Why are these so similar? Well, they both have a very common thing, and that's people. Uh, they're both integrated around making life better and trying to better understand people. So behavioural science is very broadly the understanding of human behaviour. But the key thing, and behaviour is a, a word that will define our generation, the key thing is that it's experimental. It's trying to challenge that traditional economic view that we behave in a self-interested, rational way. It starts from the point of view that actually the world is an incredibly complex place and there's many, many environmental, economic, social factors that influence our behaviours. Our job as behavioural scientists is therefore to tease out those causal relationships try and understand what are the crucial factors that influence the behaviours. And the best way to do that is through experiments. It's using scientific and empirical methods to infer those causal relationships. These principles that come out of this work can then inform the design of products and services that generally uh, can improve people's lives. Design, on the other hand, again, is completely uh, centred around people. User-centred design, another a phrase coined by uh, Don Norman, uh, describes how if you can create things that actually generally improve people's lives, then that's where the business opportunity will come from. Design is something that we use strategically. It's not something that is uh, simply desirable or about aesthetics. It's a form of creative problem solving. So it's a way of reimagining problems. Rather than thinking from a top-down point of view, thinking about, well, if I've got to, to meet this bottom line or I have a product that I want to sell, it's about understanding, well, what's the person at the start of it? Who is the person? Who? It's about asking who. Then if we can improve their lives and come up with ideas quickly, prototype quickly, uh, then we can fail quickly and we can reimagine problems and, and come up with innovative new solutions. And this is really the key to it. It's, it's trying to push people back into that uncertainty accept that there's many problems that we, we don't understand and actually try and explore new opportunities and new ways of doing it. So we have uh, kind of two principles, I guess, that we, we work to. The first is move beyond the message. And this uh, quote from my fairy Rotterdam beautifully sums it up. Um, so just saying no prevents teenage pregnancy the way have a nice day cures chronic depression. And it's something that's, that's still very pervasive. And it, it comes from this point of view, and you'll see it in government campaigns, marketing <coughs> campaigns, advertising campaigns, that people's behaviours, when they appear self-defeating, so when we choose the, the chocolate cake over going to the gym, or we boil the kettle, I think something like 2.5 times for every cup of tea, that we've made that active decision to do so. That we've kind of summed up our, our options, much like a judge summing up evidence in a case, and decided to do something. The result is that we believe maybe the best way to change people's behaviours is to focus on things like skills, knowledge and information, because clearly they lack the will or the knowledge to make the right choice. And even though those things are incredibly important, they're not enough. They're not enough to change people's behaviours. Otherwise, we'd all be eating five a day and be nice and slender. So to give you an example, um, 
And one of the, uh, I guess, arguments raging at the moment is around calorie information. So if we give people more information about their foods, will they, will they buy uh, different products? So soft drinks, in the average soft drink, uh, a 600 ml soft drink, there's 16 packs of sugar. If you have one of those a day, that's 23 kilograms. It's enormous. And this is one of the things that's um, often cited as one of the reasons behind the rising ob obesity epidemic in the States as well as here in the UK. So a team of researchers um, out in Baltimore in the States did a simple experiment. So uh, in four different corner stores, they had uh, three different types of intervention. In one, they simply provided the calorie information. So this is X many calories. In the second, they gave the percentage recommendation or, or how much it was of, of your diet. And in the third, they gave uh, actual activity. So if you drink this can of Sprite or Coke, it'll roughly take you about 40 minutes of run to burn it off. So they saw a, a decrease across the board, um, but the most significant change came with the uh, daily activity because it was making that information relevant to daily life. It was rather than just simply bombarding people with data and information, it was saying, hold on, no, we've got to make it relevant to your daily life and we can guide and support you in making better decisions. So the second principle we work to is you've got to create opportunities for enterprise. So um, uh, right, right in my introduction, it was the point that, and again to the point of convergence, that we all need to work together. And this is a headline uh, after the All Medical Royal Colleges released their uh, very frightening report on obesity in the UK which basically said that we are the, the fat man of Europe. And of, of some of their uh, suggestions, one, one very reasonable uh, or set of suggestions was, how can we make the healthy choice the easy choice? So the things they recommended were calorie information, of which the uh, evidence is still limited, and of course a fat tax. So can we put uh, higher taxes on products in high salt, fat or sugar? So, of course, the immediate response from industry was, was up in arms. This is disgraceful. It's anti-commercial. Uh, these solutions are seen as uh, anti-commercial and, and regulatory and fundamentally anti-business. So there, straight away, you've isolated the group of businesses that are closest to the decisions of the people you're trying to influence. You fundamentally need to get those people to work together if any of these things are going to change. So at the Design Council, we work on design challenges, which are open innovation competitions, trying to turn these big societal issues into new opportunities for enterprise, social enterprise, independent businesses, actually uh, making growth, uh, creating innovation in, in specific markets. So to give you an, uh, an example of, of one of those um, uh, challenges was a, a challenge called Living Well with Dementia. And this was funded by the Department of Health, uh, the challenge being that um, an aging population is one of the biggest uh, problems we'll face in the next kind of 50 to 100 years. So how can we alleviate the pressure of the state? If it's something as, as public services are continuing to be cut, how can we find innovative new solutions? So they approached the Design Council, a safe space to innovate, and said, okay, well, we need to find an area within this. I mean, living well with dementia, that's an enormous area. So we did some work on, on finding uh, specific areas of opportunity where we believed um, we could make a difference. And one of those areas was nutrition. And we funded five products and services. And one of them was a, as a product called Ode, which is a partnership between Rod Design and the Olfactory Experience. And this just beautifully merges a behavioral insight, some psychology with fantastic design skills, this relationship between smell and memory. So one of the, the big problems in dementia is that people forget to eat. Uh, they become malnourished and they slip into care. So this is just a beautifully simple idea. It looks like an iPod on a plate, and it just releases a scent at mealtimes. So Bakewell tart, fish and chips, the idea that this stimulates an appetite and people remember to eat and so they go and, uh, uh, and either cook or, or go and badger their partner to eat. So it was developed through an open innovation process. I mean, at the start of this process, would you have imagined that that was something that would come out the end? But this is an independent organization now pre-production selling this product at the gale that this is, these are people that will buy products and services to improve their quality of life. It's incredibly important. So along uh, the other uh, products and services we funded, one was called uh, Dementia Dog, which was a partnership between Glasgow School of Art, Guide Dogs for Blind, and um, uh, Alzheimer's Scotland. And this is very similar kind of concept. Well, hold on, if one of the problems with dementia sufferers is that they uh, kind of become trapped in their houses, then what's the best thing to get them out? Everybody loves dogs. You get them out in the park, it's a sense of routine. So again, these are all ideas that possibly wouldn't even be imagined at the start of it, but that's the beauty of the in open innovation process. So to bring these two worlds back together, we use the Design Council Double Diamond. And this is a way of uh, stimulating innovation in particular areas. So normally, when someone approaches a problem, they'll approach it from the start, at the point of a brief. And they'll have this real prejudice towards what the solution is. They'll say, we have a service that we believe needs fixing, or we have a product that needs some kind of incremental change. 
and we push them back into the first diamond. We push them back to actually discover the problem. Try to understand who, so going back to that design principle, who is it that we're trying to benefit? What are the behaviors we're trying to change? The second step is once you have a, a, a descriptive understanding of the problem, it's about using behavioral insights to understand why do people behave the way they do. And this is where the role of experiments and inferring those causal relationships is so important. And this is what gets you to the point of, of a brief. And we understand that probably the best people to, to come up with these solutions isn't us, it's the crowd. So you have to crowdsource ideas and you want people to come up with new ideas and you have to go to the crowd. So then we ask people to explore again. We understand that if you put a brief out there with a specific opportunity, then there's going to be multiple routes to success. And the whole point of open innovation is that there is inherent uncertainty. And this is the beauty of this, that it can manage that uncertainty. So we excite people, we ask them to explore, explode back out again and start developing quickly. So the old uh, kind of fell, fell, fell quick, fell, fell safe. And then finally, how do you deliver? How do you refine your products? And it goes back to the experimental scientific methods. Using experiments to rigorously test and evaluate and refine. The purpose of evaluation is to improve, not just to prove. So finally, you get to a set of a proof of concept so you can demonstrate short-term impact. This Impact is a word that's disbanded about a lot, and no one has that solution between long and short term. But we believe this is a way of showing proof of concept using both kind of creative methods and rigorous scientific methods. So if there's one kind of final message that I want to leave you, is that as you look forward to the next 600 years, let alone the next 50, then this idea of convergence between the creative arts and science is the only way we're really going to tackle these, these big, knotty issues. And if you want to tackle them, you both need a platform to create ideas. You need people to be able to generate good, innovative ideas, and you also need a very rigorous way of testing and improving them, because that's the only way that you'll be able to come up with something that truly works. And that, in its essence, is, is what behavioral science is. Thank you very much.